talking this morning about a, a subject on my heart that I think God is actually doing in this city, uh, specifically in our church and in churches around the area. Uh, we're going to be speaking on revival this morning. And the reason being, I know that uh, there's been some beginnings of revival that's been happening. One of the things is unity of churches that, you know, they were all in one accord when the Spirit was poured out. And I believe that's happening in our city as we have more and more pastors that are networking and coming on our group chats and uh, doing events with us together. And so I, I see that happening. Denominational lines are not separating us anymore. And we're seeing the unity of churches and pastors, which is awesome. And I believe that's going to continue to grow in Albuquerque. Also, we've had several, uh, three weeks in a row, significant healings that have happened in our church that I just believe is a sign of God's goodness. And I believe it's a sign of greater things to come. In addition to that, then we have a financial breakthrough miracle, uh, which just wasn't even asked for. How many miracles would you like about that, right? I mean, you know, you, you don't even, you know, do anything in the natural to get something like that, and God just does it. Uh, a wonderful moving of God. Uh, and so I believe that the, these are all signs of things that are going to happen when it comes to revival and revival in our church. And so I want us to be prepared for it. I know God's not looking for a perfect people. He'll never be able to find a perfect people. There's not, they don't exist. Now, God, with his righteousness, that you know, he sees us as perfect because he forgives us of all our sins. But there is no perfect people, but he is looking for surrendered people. That's what he's looking for. And sometimes I feel like God is, you know, waiting and he's, 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 he's not, it's not, look, there's nothing that I could do. There's nothing that man can do to, to force like a move of God, a, 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 an outpouring of God or, or what we would call revival. There's nothing that we can do in our own nature to, to, to force that. You know, I, we can get the best technology in the room. We can, you know, get the emotions going, whatever that might look like. But it, that wouldn't be called a move of God. That'd be called a move of man. And I'm not looking for a move of man, and, and I'm not against any technology being used in the services. But all I'm saying is, is I, we can't force God to move in that way, but what we can do is be prepared. And I believe that sometimes God is in his wisdom, in his mercy, in his justice. He's just waiting until the right time to move so that we don't miss him. And so that there's actually people who would be able to steward what God's done. And what God is doing. When we look at the word revival, we see it's a noun. And it, uh, you know, in the, you know, like Webster Dictionary, it would be called reawakening of religious fervor. But when you break down revival, what it really means is to bring back to life something which was dead. Something that had died that needs to be resuscitated, needs to be revived. Revival is something that has happened in the Bible. We see it happening. The, the word revival is not in the Bible, but we see it, the moves of God happening in the Bible. And we've seen revival happening throughout the history of the church. And when revival happens, we're not looking for something that stays within the four walls of the church. See, everyone needs personal revival. Everyone needs a personal awakening, a personal, uh, you know, connection with God, an encounter with God that just, you know, the blinders fall off your eyes and, and, and you are just alive in Christ. And, and we all need that. But then there becomes a time where it goes from personal revival to corporate revival. Where it's actually not about the person, whether they want to get touched or not. If they get close to the building, they just get touched by God. They might not even want to be touched by God, and God touches them. And I've seen that happen in different moves of God. And so uh, I, I am excited, but I also want us to get prepared for what God's doing. Now let's look at our text in uh, Acts 2, 1 through 5. Um, this is the outpouring of the Spirit in uh, the New Testament. I'm going to turn there for you. Bible keeps skipping over it. Here we go. There we go. All right. <clears throat> Acts 2, 1 through 5. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and it divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each and every one of them. 
And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in the Jews devout men from every nation under heaven. Um, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, I first, you know, it's interesting, it started in a home, but it doesn't stay within the four walls. It pours outside just like it did in Acts 2. Now these people were, uh, the Holy Spirit came upon them, the tongues of fire, and they were speaking in other tongues. And there was a lot of people in the street from another gathering, they were from different nations, and they started to hear these people speaking in different languages that was not their language, that was their language, and, uh, but not the native language of the speaker, and they were hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ being spoken. And for some reason, they thought that these people were inebriated. You know, Peter, he ends up saying, standing up, these people are not drunk as you suppose. Which, you know, I've heard people speak in other languages before. I never once assumed they were drunk. <laughs> never once. What, what it infers is that there might have been a behavior in which these people appeared as if they had been drinking. Now listen, everything that God does, the enemy has a perversion for a false of. Common word for alcohol is something called spirits. People often call it liquid courage when a man usually doesn't have the confidence to ask for another woman's number but he'll have a few drinks in them and they call that liquid courage. But see, that's the false spirit. The Holy Spirit, when he comes upon you, you don't need any other inebriation. And this power comes upon them, they start speaking in other tongues and people are getting convicted because they're hearing the gospel in their native language. And I don't know how they were behaving, you know, maybe they were you know, speaking in tongues, holding on to the wall like this. I don't know. Maybe they were laying down and speaking in tongues. And, but they thought they were drunk. And Peter comes up and gives this message. And then in Acts 2, 17 through 21, I'm actually going to read it from the book here. You can follow along if you'd like, if you brought your Bible. Or you can open up your app. Peter starts quoting the Old Testament because he gets up to preach. He says, And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Everyone say all. all. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and in the signs on the, and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and vapor and smoke. And the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I believe that the Lord wants to move powerfully in Albuquerque, powerfully in your home, powerfully in our church, but I believe that repentance is going to be required. Now, repentance in the Greek is called metanoia. Many of you have probably heard that before. Maybe, maybe you haven't. And metanoia literally means change the way you think. Jesus first mentions this when he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What Jesus is saying is, change the way you think because the kingdom of God is easily accessible. This repentance needs to happen, but it's also a repentance of surrender. It's, it's saying like, I've realized something, something I was holding on to, I need to give up. The direction I was going in is actually the wrong direction. 
the, 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 uh, the, the behavior I was doing is actually wrong behavior, and I've be now become aware. It's not like you were just convinced. It's like you've become aware. And I don't know if you've ever felt this awareness before. I'm sure you have. It's almost like when you, you, you know, may, directionally, maybe you're driving somewhere, and it's like you, you, you think you're going the right way, and someone makes you realize that you are l literally driving the wrong way, and you have the epiphany, oh, I'm driving the wrong way. And your whole mode of thinking, your whole, you know, opus morendi, every, everything is, is, is all your modus, uh, M-O, modus operandi. Wow, I'm so amazing. I can do that. I can change that whole, la I made a new Latin. That's literally pig Latin. Okay. Oh my goodness. The, the, your whole thing could change. Oh, Jesus, help me. All right, let's go to the next verse. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Acts 3.19, it says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. 2 Peter 3.9 says, the, no, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some under, understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to re repentance. And I believe this, I mean, I love this verse because I believe that God is just waiting to pour out his spirit because he's waiting for us to first come into alignment with his spirit in a way of repentance that we've never experienced before. And if you think that because you got saved and because you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you've reached the pinnacle of what it means to be in Christ. Look, there is more. Being filled with the Spirit, you know, um, so much depth in Him. You will never find the end of God. Um, and so I think God is waiting just, I mean, I feel like I said the beginnings of this outpouring that's going to come upon this house and the houses around the city but I believe we need to come into a place of repentance. And I, and, and I believe that the Lord's gonna be speaking to you individually, just knocking on your heart where we need to give up some things. See, if you look at revivals historically, repentance always precedes revival. It does, it does. The Welsh Revival in 1904, 1905. Well, first, let's talk about the first. I mean, I skipped this whole one section. 19, uh, in 1906, in a tumble-down shack in downtown Los Angeles, one of the greatest revivals in American history began uh, uh, roughly in the size of the average American home. The humble building was on 312 Azusa Street, and it became a holy place. Thousands of people came to see and experience what was happening, and none of them seemed to care how low the ceilings were, how many flies buzzed around because the building was converted from a, a stable for horses, or even that the seating was made out of makeshift benches of planks and empty nail boxes. The Los Angeles Times wrote that the devotees of the weird doctrine practiced the most fanatical rites, preached the wildest theories, and worked themselves into a state of mad excitement in their peculiar zeal. They didn't know because they weren't a part of it. They were just writing what they observed, but they had no idea. And while the building no longer stands there today, the movement was known as the 1906 Azusa Street Revival and is still active and at work around the world through a Pentecostal movement of more than 70 million people in over 150 countries. Two years prior to the Azusa Street Revival was the Welsh Revival, 1904 to 1905. The Welsh Revival was a powerful movement of the Holy Spirit that began in Wales and rapidly spread, impacting the churches and communities. The revival was marked by what? Deep repentance, by fervent prayer, and a renowned passion for God among believers. Here's a look at how repentance played a pivotal role in this revival. The beginnings of the revival 
where repentance, Evan Roberts, Evan Roberts, a young coal miner turned Bible student, felt a profound burden for the salvation of souls and the spiritual state of the church in Wales. And in his early 20s, Roberts explained and experienced a deep personal revival through intense prayer and repentance. He spent hours each day in, one, in prayer asking God to bend the church and to bring people to repentance. One night, he attended a small meeting where a preacher spoke about the need for personal revival. Roberts was deeply moved and responded with a heartfelt repentance and a renewed commitment to seek God's face. He began to pray, bend me, O Lord, bend me. This is personal repentance and a cry for a deeper walk with God became the catalyst for the wider revival. His message of repentance that Robert preached was four simple points. Confess all known sin to God. Deal and get rid of anything doubtful in your life and be ready to obey the Holy Spirit instantly and publicly confess Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to understand that when revival happens in a church, it should not only change your church, it should change your city. Don't tell me you have revival in your church and your crime rates aren't going down. Don't tell me you have revival in your church and the poverty isn't being broken. Don't tell me you have revival in your church and marriages aren't being restored. There needs to be an outward movement in an inward church revival. Personal revival will start with you. It's about you repenting. It's about you getting your heart aligned with God. It's about you becoming one with God, even more so. That's a personal revival. It should then spread through, through your household. It should be a thing that comes upon your neighbors. It should be a thing that spreads through our church as a corporate move of God. So it involves you, but it's not just about you. And I think one thing about the gospel message that we have to understand that some preachers don't really tell very well is it's not about you only. It's about all of us. It's ultimately about him. Personal revival is transformative. But a move of God goes beyond a personal revival. It becomes corporate when no one is safe from a touch of God. We need a personal revival and a corporate move of God if we want to see the city saved. A London pastor named Martin Lloyd once said, in the next slide, <laughs> the church always looks like the church in the New Testament when she is in the midst of revival. And I, I beckon that we should, and I reckon that we should compare ourselves to what the church was doing at some times. I know that we are in need to surrender. I didn't put it up there, but the same pastor from London, uh, Lloyd-Jones, he said, uh, God does not merely give us teaching, he also gives us history. And if we're only receiving teaching and we're not building a history with God, I wonder if we're really living in a life that's awakened, a life that's revived. We need to surrender. And I don't know what that is. And I'll never know, unless you tell me personally, what you need to surrender. But God knows. And I would bet he's already telling you. It could be a thing, it could be a time, it could be a moment, it could be whatever. But he's asking us to surrender. Now we saw that in the... Um, Acts 2, that the tongues of fire had come upon them. Whenever you see tongues of fire or any fire in the Bible, it is always a purifying fire. It is always a fire that sanctifies. It's a fire that cuts away. It's a fire that purifies you. And when you ask God to light you on fire, it's a great thing. But what he's doing is he's removing everything that actually needs to be out of your life. And it could be anything from the lies you're believing about yourself that God never intended you to believe or take on. To attaching your identity with an identity he never told you to be or become. And I'm not talking about gender identity, by the way. I'm just talking about being someone who he hasn't called you to be. You're wearing a mask and you shouldn't. That's what I'm talking about. But will we be vulnerable enough with him to be able to repent to him, to be able to align ourselves back to him, to give everything to him? And, and, and I think 
we'll have some ministry. We, we did an earlier worship because I know God is going to move. I know he's already moving. And we're going to do an altar call at some point. And it's up to you if you want to come forward. And if you're coming forward, it might be because your life's a mess and you want to give it all to him and all that stuff. But uh, I won't know that. By the way, this place shouldn't even be a place of shame. It should be a place of redemption and restoration. And, and if you are that way, you should come up here boldly, not caring, because God will take you as you are. He doesn't need you to get better before you see him. But you could be coming up here for any reason, and I wouldn't know it, but because that's between you and God. But I, I do know it needs to start here. There's a... Um, a pastor, a preacher that I, I, I've listened to often, and, and he's, uh, he's passed on now, and his name's Leonard Ravenhill. Wonderful, wonderful pastor. Preacher, he's scary to listen to, actually. But someone had a clip of one of his sermons where he couldn't even finish his sermon because people were running to the altars. And um, man, when I listen to the clip, it makes me burn. And I want to give an opportunity for us to bring the start of the revival through repentance. And I want to have an opportunity for us to watch this video and then I'll pray and we'll do some ministry. But let the Holy Spirit speak to you. I'm sick of theology and words. We need God to move in our midst. O oh, thou that dwellest between the cherubims, Lord, don't stay there. Come down here. The one thing that alarms me in America and England is that there is no alarm in the church. You say America needs God. No, she doesn't. The church needs God. If the church gets God, America will soon feel it. She'll be staggering. A preacher said something the other day that's very disturbing to an audience that he was addressing. He said, I want to tell you that if God withdrew the Holy Spirit from my church today, it would function tomorrow the same way we wouldn't even know he'd gone. And me thinks that might be written of many churches in that we become so mechanical. We go in at 11 and come out at 12 and the Holy Ghost must come and we open the door of the church and he must leave when we lock it. And we try and lay down the track and say, come Holy Ghost, for thee we call spirit of burning, come, but come our way. We lay down the conditions. Holy Ghost, come, but please don't violate our theology. Don't upset our status quo. Don't break our hearts over the lost world. Oh, yes, yes, preachers. You and I will raise our hearts to Finney and Gold. And we raise our hearts to the mortars. And we thank God for the last drop of their blood. But we won't give him the first drop of ours. I can't live another day without the fire of God. Consuming me everything that's on Christ's life. Consuming me everything which hinders surrender everything. That's revival. When you can't sit through the meeting, you feel you've got a burning cancer. If I don't get to the cross now, I may die before the meeting's over. Every preacher who has lost the fire, you should be on your face down here. You used to burn, but you got so busy with organizing. The fire has gone out. Come on. You can't patch up your prayer life when you get to the judgment seat. You can't sacrifice when you get to the judgment seat. You can't weep when you get to the judgment seat. It's all between here and there. Listen, if our God is a consuming fire, and he is, if he takes up residence in you, you'll burn till you die. God needs a torch of holy fire in your house. He wants a fire in you to read the word of God to your family. He wants the fire of God, your neighbors will know. I can't live in coldness anymore. I can't live in blindness anymore. I can't be indifferent to a dying world. Yes. 
Glory. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. If that's you, just come. Just let's let's fill these altars and get on our face before God and minister to him. Lord, I just pray right now. I don't want to be cold anymore. God, I want to burn for you. God, I want to burn for you. Lord, I want your city. I want to see so many people come to know you in a personal relationship, Jesus. Lord, we surrender everything, God. Light us on fire. Come on, church. Lord, I ask that you would purify your church. I ask that you would light us on fire. I ask that you burn up everything that's not on you, that's not of you, anything that's unchristlike in me, God. Father, I just pray that we would lay our lives down for the sake of the gospel. That they would know us by our love for one another, God, that they would know us that when they see us, they would see Christ. Lord, I don't wanna be the same. I don't wanna come in and leave the same way. God, change us, Lord. Thank you, God, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you just want a holy fire to burn in you, just lift your hands. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we pray for the fire of God to burn in us, Lord. Just pray between you and God. Come on, right now, while Stephen leads us into worship.
Lord, we pray for revival, God. Lord, we pray for revival in our hearts. Lord, but we also pray for revival in this church. We pray for revival in this city. God, we pray that the poverty rates would be broken in Jesus' name, that poverty would be broken. We pray that addiction would be broken in this city in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that families would be restored right now. We declare right now that prodigals will come home in Jesus' name. We pray right now that marriages would be restored in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you, God, for all the lost that are gonna get saved, Lord. We thank you in advance, God, because we know it's gonna get, it's gonna happen. And so we're so grateful, God, for your outpouring of your spirit, Lord. And God, we just want to align our hearts as a church, as a congregation, as one-on-one with you, Lord. God, we ask that you would just forgive us of anything we've put in front of you. Any distraction, God. Anything that's eaten up our time that was unfruitful, that you didn't want us to actually do, Lord. We just, we surrender it to you right now, God. And we just thank you, Lord, for the breaking of every bondage that's on our life right now in Jesus' name. We thank you for the breaking of strongholds, Lord. I thank you that this place is going to be known as a place for deliverance, Lord. Father, that people will be set free and they will be free indeed. And that this house will be a house of freedom. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for people getting healed. We thank you that disease would just leave people's bodies as the name of Jesus is spoken, Lord. God, we thank you in advance for those healings, God. So, Lord, would you burn in this church? Would you burn in our hearts? Would you burn over us, God? Thank you, Lord. We thank you, God. God, give them dreams and visions. Wherever you are in this room, sitting in your seat or on the altar, may the Lord speak to you. Have a conversation with him right now. Get real with him right now. Do it on this side of heaven. If you've been living a subpar Christian life, just say, God, I'm tired of that. I do not want to leave the way I came. We just speak freedom over your life in the name of Jesus. I speak freedom over your family right now in the name of Jesus. I got this word today from this prophet that, um, this woman who goes to our church, Sharon, and she sends me words once in a while and she didn't even know what I was gonna be speaking on today. And before I got on stage, she said, the bellows are blowing, firing the flames, the flames of redemption and healing and breaking off the lies, the shame, the guilt, the pain. She had no idea what I'd be sharing on 
I just believe it's a divine appointment. I believe God is wanting to stir this up. And so, Lord, we give you all the glory, Jesus. We pursue you, Lord. a couple more minutes we're going to go and then um, I'm going to ask for a couple more minutes we're going to go into worship and then I'll close in prayer but I really um, I really want to challenge you to get right with God as well whatever that looks like Yeah, if people haven't responded during worship, just come on up. So. Spirit of God, for fresh on us, we need your presence, your key. Why don't you stand? We'll close in prayer. If you want to stay here for worship, you can. We're going to be ministering for a little bit longer. 
If you want to grab your child and come back into the sanctuary, you're more than welcome to do that as we uh, continue to, I know some of us are going to want to press in. But Lord, I just dedicate this day to you, Lord, this church to you. This isn't my church. It's your church. And Lord, we ask that you would do what only you can do. God, may our hearts turn towards you, Lord. May we live radically for you, God. Holy Spirit, continue to move outside the four walls of this church. May you move in the streets and in the city. May you break the disease of mental illness and bring mental health and clarity to everyone burdened with that in the city. Lord, I want to see radical change in Albuquerque, in our church, in our own homes, God. And Lord, I pray that you would pour out your spirit mightily as so many words have come forward that you would. And so we believe on those things. Holy Spirit, continue to burn within us and may the fire never go out. In Jesus' name, amen you want to come forward, come on forward. If you want prayer for anything that you need prayer for, please come forward. We'd love to pray with you. If you just want to press in as we linger here with the Lord, you can do that as well. Bless you guys. Have a great, great Sunday.